Just a quick reminder, I'm only covering the topics that I think are the trickiest for people and the ones that I think are most likely to get overlooked if I don't bring them up. So make sure that you're looking through things in greater detail and make sure that you're practicing some of these calculations too. Now one of the terms that ends up falling through the cracks for most people is the idea of formal concentration. And this is going to have a lot of importance for us later in the course, especially when we start talking about titrations. We're actually going to be calculating a concentration at any spot along a titration for a strong acid titrating, a weak acid, strong base with a weak acid, things like that. So we want to make sure that we're very comfortable with this terminology. Now formal concentration is what we've been talking about as concentration most of the time up until now. This is what we're making. Well, that's right, what we use to make something. That's a better way to say it. In other words, if I say that I have 10 grams of NaCl, and I drop that into water, let's say that I put that into one liter of water. And notice, boy, am I being crude on my sig figs? We will definitely be polishing in our significant figures very soon. Uh, we should be using them already. It'll be a critical importance coming up because we're going to start talking a little bit about the statistics and we're going to find that sig figs are the shortcut that we can often use to save ourselves a lot of calculation and a lot of trouble. But to come back to the topic at hand, so what we do here to calculate our concentrations, we say, okay, great, I've got 10 grams of NaCl. I know I need to get this into moles. So I'm going to model using the fence post approach for this. So we have 10 grams of NaCl. I'm going to go to my periodic table. I'm going to get my mass of NaCl. Off to the side, I'll set up a little table to make my calculation. I do NaCl. I have one atom of each. Sodium is going to be 22.989. And chlorine. Although there's actually a little bit of controversy over this in the field right now, uh, people are kind of having an active debate about what we should be using as the value on the periodic table because chlorine, its mass really depends heavily on where it came from. And you'll find that throughout the periodic table. Different elements on a really good periodic table are going to have a different number of sig figs shown. A great example of that would be front cover of your textbook. So please make sure you take a look at that. You notice that lots of these actually do show many different numbers of places. Hydrogen we know to five decimal places. Uh, technetium we only list to two whole number places. You know, and there's going to be reasons for that that will come up a little bit later in the course. So start getting comfortable pulling your sig figs in and write down all of the ones you have every time unless you see that one of them is going to make you chop everything so short that you can emit some later units, uh, some later places. Start being rigorous about that right now. Now normally I multiply across, I multiply across and then I add down the column. You can see I don't need to do that since I only have one of each atom. We do need to have a calculator up here though. Okay, so we have 22.989 plus 35.453 gives us 58.442. grams per mole. When we add and subtract, we chop off at the shortest number of sig figs trailing in the decimal. They both have three sig figs, so we don't have anything to do with that. So very simple calculation for us here. All right, so grams per mole. I know I want to get rid of the word grams, so I'm going to put 58.442 grams in one mole. Once again, I'm going to be rigorous and put in my species. Sodium chloride and sodium chloride. Grams cross-canceled and sodium chloride cross-canceled. I'm now in moles of sodium chloride. Now, if I wanted to know the moles of chloride ion I have, knowing that this is completely soluble in water under almost all circumstances, we could say, well, I'm going to get one mole of NaCl to form one mole of Na+. And I know that just by looking at the stoichiometry. Right here, 
is the difference between our definitions. Our formal concentration of sodium chloride would be if we hit the equal sign right now. Because that's what we made. And most of the time, this is all we're going to ask. We're going to say, okay, well, what concentration is the sodium chloride? We'll plug it in. Now, because this is a strong solute, it's going to be completely dissociated, 100% dissociated. So 100% convert into Na+. What we made? Concentration. This is going to be the actual concentration of a specific ion. Now this isn't such a big deal because you can see no, the number didn't change at all when it's something strong. But suppose that this was going to be one of our weak acids. Well, the book actually brings up an example of this. So if you go to page 17, you don't have to go there if you don't want, but on page 17, in the middle of the page, they talk about acetic acid being a weak electrolyte. And they point out that at the formal concentration of 0 0.10 formal, which just means molarity, but we'll actually write that as, and here this is a separate number, so I'll just kind of separate it off, 0 0.10 formal. This means that it's 0 0.10 molar when we made it. and assuming that it was going to completely dissociate, which isn't at all what's going to happen. And it's certainly not going to say completely associated. What we're going to have is we're going to have a mixture of acetic acid with the proton still on it, and we're going to have And this is going to be something else you'll see us do a lot of the time. Rather than writing out the ion, we'll often just use the abbreviation for the ion. So acetic acid, the acetate ion with H plus on it, ends up in equilibrium with acetate ion and H plus. If we were to find the concentration of this, it turns out only 1.3% of this concentration would be dissociated. As we make it more and more dilute, what we're going to see is that it's going to end up dissociating more and more often. Now, let me just bring up the reason for that. Keep in mind what we're talking about. Sitting inside of our beaker, we start out with our proton and our anion paired up. Let's say this is at instant equals zero. We dropped our acetic acid into there, and it started out totally associated. What's going to happen is that some of these are going to now start popping apart. Formal concentration told us at instant equals zero if nothing had dissociated. This is what we made starting out. Equilibrium concentrations tell us that, mm, yeah, no, some of them actually did pop apart, and this is going to be the current concentration. Now, as we make this more and more dilute, notice what ends up happening. Suppose we started with the water level right here at the beginning. Now let's go ahead and dilute it even further by upping the water level to here. For these two to reassociate, they have to find each other. When we added more water, it's harder for them to find each other because they end up taking so much time walking these random walk trails all over this volume. Meanwhile, remember this is an equilibrium. These are popping apart and popping back together every now and then. It's just that at any given time we generally have one molecule popped apart in my sketch. Now that we've diluted it, these two haven't found each other. Enough time's gone by that time for these two to pop apart. And they're all going to have a little bit harder of a time finding each other than they would have with the smaller volume. So they're going to stay dissociated longer, meaning that at any given moment we have a higher concentration of dissociated. <clears throat> now suppose that we hypothetically increase this to be such a large volume that it was like it was infinity. Well, that means as they get apart, they're going to get so far apart going through our solution, they're probably never going to find each other again. And that's called the infinite dilution condition. The idea is that at that point, they're never going to find each other again. They will stay 100% dissociated. So the more and more dilute you get, the closer you are to keeping everything totally 
dissolved and dissociated. As you make things more and more concentrated, you're likely to force them to stay associated. So if you go grab a sulfuric acid bottle that's really concentrated, almost all those sulfuric acid molecules are going to be completely intact. They won't have popped apart into their ions because they're so packed in there that they're constantly reassociating immediately. So they're going to be totally associated, or at least very close to it. Even though it's a strong acid, its actual concentrations are probably very close to its formal concentration, right up till you start diluting it. So there's just a little bit of the language that surrounds formal concentration and some of the concepts that are hiding underneath the surface as well.